Okay, hello everyone. My name is Yaniv Ehrlich and I'm a fellow at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. Thank you very much for joining me to my talk about genome hacking. So what I'm going to talk today is uh, I'm going to discuss the results of our recent study that we showed how you can identify anonymous whole genome sequencing data using basically internet searches. And my lab at the Whitehead Institute in Human Genetics is interested in, in a range of topics um, in, in human genetics. And we published two papers about um, the genetic basis of two devastating disorders. One is a hereditary spastic paraparesis, uh, and the other one is Schubert syndrome. And I would like to emphasize the point that we were not able to publish and to identify these two genes in these disorders without people sharing data about their own genome. Healthy people share their own data and we can use the, uh, uh, these data sets to exclude mutations that are not causative in these two studies. So I would like to start my talk by emphasizing the point that public data sharing is highly important, but we also need to understand the privacy expectations and or to tune the privacy expectations of participants in these studies if we want to have a, a long-term sustainable endeavor. Now the interest in uh, uh, working on these uh, topics goes to the day that I was an undergrad student and I worked as a, let me go one slide back, so I, 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 I was an what you just saw because the movie was played prematurely. Basically, um, I worked as a security, uh, um, in a security uh, company and we used to give services for banks, credit, uh, uh, credit card companies to check the robustness of their systems. So what we used to do is to go to these uh, uh, um, companies and to try to do penetration tests. And the movie that I just, uh, that was just played on the screen was basically a penetration test in one of the banks that I worked. But I think it was, if we can maybe play it again, I can, I can explain you what, what we saw over there. just uh, uh, using my own cell phone I'm, I'm can, I can manipulate the, the door in this bank and enter to the IT department. Anyhow, let's maybe skip to the next slide and let me talk about privacy in genomics instead of privacy in a, or instead how to hack into a bank. So I cannot see my slides for some reason, just for a moment. Okay, I hope that you can see my slide at least. Okay, so the starting point of this presentation about the, the privacy of whole genome sequencing data is a study, is, is, a, is a manuscript published about a year ago by the NCI think tank. And in this uh, manuscript, they said that all omics data are theoretically identifiable but you really need a considerable effort and cost to be able to identify individuals uh, uh, in these data sets. And they concluded that the risk is highly remote. And this is a starting point of our study. We wanted to challenge it to see basically the same, the same way that we did penetration tests in the bank, 
to, to check empirically the robustness of their system. We wanted to empirically check the statement over here. So about a decade ago, it has been recognized that there is cross-segregation between Y chromosome and surnames. I cannot control my slides there. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to fix the animation in my slide because I cannot move through, through my slide. I'm really sorry about this technical difficulty. Let's try. Okay, here, here we go. So here we have, a, a, so as, as I told you that a decade ago, there, there, it has been recognized that there is cross segregation between Y chromosome and surname. For instance, here we have the Smith family. So if this family has a son, then the father will give the son his Y chromosome and also his surname. Now, in, in most Western societies, now, if this son is getting married, he will give, and also has a son, he will give his son his Y chromosome and also his surname. And this process will continue forward and will only break up by mutation events, non-paternity events, and explicit surname conversions. Now, recreational uh, genealogy companies uh, um, also thought that they can they can use this process basically to connect between patrilineal relatives. So today, there are multiple companies that offer services in which they will send you a swab to check uh, uh, the DNA uh, uh, to, to to sample the DNA in your cheek. You put this swab in a mail envelope and send it to the company with 200 bucks. Very important, and then the company will genotype short tandem repeats, STRs, on your Y chromosome and, and will upload the, uh, uh, the information to um, a website. So for instance, here, they, they, the information can go to ysearch.org. Now, during my presentation, I encourage you, since you have also internet connection, to go to these websites and to see that they exist and that, to see how they look like and what you can do with them. And what you see over here are my own test results basically and the reason that people uh, uh, do these uh, genetic tests is that uh, this way they can connect with their patrilineal relatives that they don't know just based on genetic matches it's a lot of fun right and as i said these are my own uh, uh, test results online so about seven years ago there was a, a very interesting article in the washington post describing a child that was conceived by anonymous sperm donation. And this child, after he grew up, he sent his DNA to one of these recreational genealogy companies. They genotyped the Y chromosome and they sent him, a, 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 he identified in their databases two hits of individuals with the same surname. These two individuals has the, the same surname. Now, he didn't know what was the surname of his own father, but he concluded that maybe this is the surname of his father, since he has these matches from on his Y chromosome. He also knew what was the exact birth date of his father and the, and the hospital. So he went to uh, private detectives. He gave all these pieces of information, the surname, the birth of date, and, and the hospital. And they were able to find one record in this hospital that matched exactly to this description. He called to the person in the record, and they, indeed this person donated sperm, so he was able to, to connect with his biological father. And we thought, okay, is, is this an incident? So, you know, it was in the newspaper. Is this something that happens one in a million, one in a thousand, one in one? We really wanted to, to do a systematic study to characterize this process and to see if it risks personal genomes. So the question is, can we cover, can, can we, uh, recover the identity of anonymous sequencing datasets using these public resources. If we can go to the Y chromosome 
submit information to these uh, uh, resources and then infer the surname of the, of the individuals and then really to get a lead and, and, and to identify the people that donated uh, uh, their DNA. So we decided to focus on two uh, uh, databases. One is smgf.org and the other one is ysearch.org. And together these databases have more than 135,000 YSTR surname records. And this data is accessible also to you. You can, as I said before, you have an internet connection, you can go to these databases and see that you can search the data. So the first thing was we wanted to see if the databases reflect the distribution of, the, uh, of surnames in the US population. So we compared the prevalence of the different surnames in the US population based on the census data. You see it here on the x-axis versus the number of records for the same surname in the database on the y-axis. And we found that there is a significant correlation between the two. In fact, 68% of the US population of the surnames, oh, oh, sorry, there is a 68% chance of sampling a random individual from the US population and that the surname of this individual will be in the database. So we don't have all the surnames in the database, but we have a significant amount of them. And for the ones that we do have in the database, they really reflect the distribution of the US population. So now we wanted empirically to check what is the probability to recover a surname of a male in the US population. Okay, so we took a YSTR of real people from the US population. We queried these two databases, SMGF and Ysearch, and then we had some sort of an algorithm to infer the most likely surname, which I will not go uh, to the technical details, but it's available on the, in, in the paper that we published. And then we inferred a surname from the, from the YSTR markers and we checked, is this the right surname or not? And we repeated this process more than 900 times, so more than 900 individuals in this process. And what we found was, oops, let me go one slide further. So first, here, here is what, what you see basically when, when we do this process. This is the, the number of successes that we have as a function of, of generation. So when we do the process, we, we, we can use the Y chromosome as a molecular clock to estimate the number of generation that pass between the YSTR of the person that we don't know the surname and the YSTRs of the best hit. We can see how much time elapsed between these two individuals and based on that get a confidence. If these two individuals are closely related, let's say are only 10 generations apart, we have higher probability that they do share the same surname, so we can increase our confidence. If they are distant individuals, let's say that they are related only 50 generations ago, right? 50 generations ago, if the every generation is 25 years, it means that these two people are related have a common ancestor that lived thousand years ago, the likelihood that they have the, sur the same surname is, is extremely low because they really share very ancient ancestor before even the advent of the surname system in, in Western societies. So what you see over here that on average, if we find an exact match of the same surname, the two, individual, the two individuals lived 10 generations ago in some very small number of cases, but very interesting, we found spelling variants of the same surname. For instance, I show you here, Ehrlich, my last surname can be spelled by two different ways, with an H and without. So we saw that people with a spelling variant, they tend to share a common ancestor, a bit, a bit older common ancestor. And when you have completely wrong, a, a wrong match, we, the, 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 the TMRC I lived 24 or, or, or more generations ago. So we can use this process really to build, a, 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 to find, to tune our signal and to zoom in on the matches that we think that are correct. So what we found was that if we uh, uh, take, if we allow for 5% 
wrong surnames in our analysis, then with this rate, the expectation for U.S. Caucasian males from middle and upper class is 12% successful recoveries. Let me maybe restate that. So, in this process, we, we can tune the confidence score of uh, our surname recovery. I can be very permissive and then get very, get very, get a lot of matches to people. But most of the time, these matches will be very old, with very old TMRCA, and will not have, these people will not have the same surname. Or I can be very uh, uh, restrictive in my tuning and only to allow, to say that the two people share the same surname only if the TMRCA is very recent, but then I, I will have less, uh, um, I will have less, less matches. So basically, we tuned it that we'll get 5% wrong recoveries, and with that rate, we can recover successfully. We get correct matches for 12% of the U.S. population. Okay, so we have 12% of the U.S., we, we can recover the surnames of 12% of the U.S. population with Caucasian ancestry for middle and upper class. But maybe all the time we just get surnames that are extremely uh, uh, um, prevalent in the population, such as Smith, Johnson, Jackson. There are millions of people in the US that will have the same surname, right? So even if I can recover the surnames, Maybe I just, I, I will not get enough information that I can zoom in and get the individual because the surname is so prevalent. So we tested that empirically. And what we found is in, in this empirical test with the 900 individuals was that in most cases, the surnames that we recover are relatively rare. In most cases, the surname corresponds to one in 4,000 people. So it means that if I know the surname, I can go from a group of 150 million males in the US to only about 40,000 males, just by knowing the surname on average. Okay, so we have 40,000 males, but now the question is, can I zoom in to a specific individual in these 40,000 males? So, okay, so surname recovery, even if it's successful, can only give me 40,000 individuals. I really want one, the one that participated in the genomic study. How can we do that? So, we, um, we thought about the following scenario. Let's assume that we didn't only recover the surname of the individual, but also we have demographic information about this individual such as the age and the state. According to the HIPAA privacy rule, age and state are not considered identifiers. So in some databases, and I'm going to show you real examples, you expect to find the age and the state of individuals that donated their, their genome. So what would happen if I have the age information, the state, and I can recover the surname? So we, did a sim we, we, we conducted simulations using the census data. We took the age distribution of males, let's say someone that is 40 years old, with uh, the state, let's say Colorado, and the surname, let's say Adams. And then we ask how many individuals in the US would match such a profile, Adams, Colorado, 40 years old. We conducted a simulation 100,000 times, and what we found was that age, state, and surname, this profile gives me less than 12 males in most of the cases. So again, we start with 150 million males in the US. If I know the surname, I can go to 40,000 individuals. Then if I add the age and the state information, I will go to 12 or less people in most cases. Now, when you have 12 people, it's very easy to know who is the individual that donated the data. First, you can just call all 12 people and ask them 
did you did you participate in a genetic study? That would be one option. Or any other other piece of information that is posted with the genome can really help you to identify the individual. For instance, the pedigree structure or, or, or other phenotypic uh, information. So that's when it becomes tractable. Okay, so, so far I just showed you um, the things that are based on, on multiple uh, pieces of evidence, right? But let's now try to stitch everything together. So we decided to focus on Craig Venter. Let's see how it works. We took Craig Venter genome from uh, NCBI. We downloaded his genome and we profiled the short tandem repeats in his, on his genome with Lobster. This is a tool that we published about a year ago in uh, genome research. And this tool allows you to profile short tandem repeats in high throughput sequencing data. So, for example, we found that Craig Venter has 17 repeats on the Y chromosome marker called DYS458. Then we went to ysearch.org, to the search mechanism, and let me zoom in. And we just inserted for each marker that we found, we just inserted the number of repeats to the search interface. And we clicked search on this web page. And after a few seconds, we found that the top match, the top surname predicted by this database is Venter. Now, I told you that this is based on publicly available resources. So if you want to replicate what I just did, you can go to the link that, that is posted on the screen right now. Bitly Craig underscore Venter underscore haplotype underscore updated. Go to this link. It will redirect you to the Ysearch webpage with all the markers that we found in the genome of Craig Venter. Just click search and see if you can recover and, and, and see that Venter is the top match uh, in, the, in the database. So basically what I just showed you was a way I just show you how we can take whole genome sequencing data of an individual and using just computational tools and publicly available resources, we can get the surname of this individual. And also we verify that this DNA doesn't belong to Craig Venter. It's someone else's in his family that donated the DNA. But okay, so we can get the surname Venter from Craig Venter genome, but can we really zoom in and get Craig Venter with this information. Let's see how it works. So if we know the state, California, and that the Craig Venter was born, the year of, of uh, birth is 1946, and he's also a male, we can go to public record uh, search engines, such as ussearch.com or peoplefinders.com, and insert these four pieces of information the surname that we recovered, the state, the year of birth, and we just, we can filter for only male hits in these, in these searches. So we did this process, and what we found in ussearch.com was we, we, we identified two individuals that matched this description. Venter, California born, were born in 1946, and they were males, one of which was our friend, Craig Venter himself. So I just showed you how we can take whole genome sequencing data and using only computational tools and internet searches to zoom in from 150 million individuals to just two individuals, including Craig Venter himself. Okay, but, but you know what? Maybe Craig Venter was just cheating, right? Because we know that this person is Craig Venter and we search for the same person that, that we know his identity. What I really want to show you is that we can use this process to identify anonymous personal genomes, not just people that we know. So we focused on the uh, CU panel in the Thousand Genomes Project. The CU panel is composed from 
participants from, from Utah. And we took 10 genomes from this panel. And again, we just profiled the Y uh, short term of in these genomes with Lobster. And then we queried these two websites with the YSTR markers. And we got eight certain predictions with Utah ancestry. So this is actually quite good, right? We, we are looking for people in Utah, and we got certain predictions with people with Utah ancestry. But did we get the right individuals? So we decided to focus first on this family that I show you over here. This is a three-generation family. Each one of the individuals in this family donated DNA data. The founders of the family, the grandparents, are part of the thousand genomes. But also the, the, the father, the mother, and all the children donated their DNA and are part of the HapMap project. And you can get their DNA. It's part of the, of, of the Curiel uh, cell repository. And uh, there are many, there are expression arrays that were done on this family, genotyping arrays, and so on. We rec using the 1,000 genomes data, we recovered the surname of the paternal grandfather and the maternal grandfather. So we had two surnames. And then we did something very simple. We went to Google and we just searched. We, we did a search very similar to what I show you on the slide. We don't disclose the exact details to respect the privacy of the family but it's something extremely similar to what, what is on the screen right now. And the search in Google, we just clicked search, the top hit of the search, the first link in this Google search was an obituary that exactly matched the description of this pedigree in the Curiel uh, cell repository. What do I mean by that? First, the number of children in this obituary was exactly the same to the number of children in the pedigree in the Creel uh, website. The birth order of males and females was exactly the same. Now this is a big this is this is a big family with multiple kids. What are the chances that each one of these kids will be exactly the same, right? The male and female. Every time it's like tossing a coin, and we toss this coin multiple times. The surname of the father in the obituary matched to the surname of the paternal grandfather. The maiden name of the mother matched to the surname of the maternal grandfather. And these two surnames are quite rare in the population. And also we check the ages of some of the people in this, uh, 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 in this pedigree and match it to the people in the obituary. And the ages were exactly the same. So what are the chances that we found the wrong family? And we did a calculation, and we estimate that the chances of finding the wrong family after scanning all households in the United States is five times 10 to the minus nine. Extremely, extremely small. But you know what? Maybe it was just beginner's luck. I just showed you one family, right? Let's see if we can replicate this process. And indeed, we can replicate it. We identified another family from this, in, from the thousand genomes using the same technique, and another family, all of which are big families, and the chances that we've identified the wrong family are quite low after scanning all households in the United States. Now, the individuals that the, the black rectangles are the individuals of which we had successful serum recoveries. So we had five successful serum recoveries that we can go back and, and find a, a fa the family. And we could identify, so again, these individuals, it's not just that the founders, just the grandparents donated their DNA, but all the entire family donated their DNA. So basically we could expose, we could link between DNA datasets in the Curial cell repository of about 50 people that because every time that we identified, we, we recovered a surname and identify one member in this family, we could identify all the other members and by that 
expose the identities of all the other people in the Coriel website. But we had so much information at that point that we could even infer the link between the people that donated their DNA to recreational genealogy and the people that participated in the Thousand Genomes project. So the people, the, the, the red labels just shows the line of the, uh, uh, the lines of people that donated their DNA to the people that we identified. And the arrows shows the people that participated, that donated their DNA to recreational genealogy. And I want to emphasize this point because it's extremely important. The people that donated their DNA to recreational genealogy are not the same people that are part of the thousand genomes. We can use a, a not we can use far relatives because of the propagation of or because of the association of Y chromosome and surnames. For example, in the pedigree uh, in the middle, you can see on the on the maternal side that the second cousin, once removed of the thousand genomes uh, participant, he donated his DNA to recreational genealogy. And by doing so, he exposed the identity of his entire family. On the third pedigree, the, 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 the pedigree on the right, you see the grandchild that is not part of the, of, of, of the Korean database donated his DNA to recreational genealogy. And by that, he exposed all, the, all his entire family, including his, his grandparents, that donated their DNA to research. So here is the thing. Maybe not. Let's let's go to the next slide. Oh, next slide over here. So let me summarize this this part. I showed you a way how we can um, breach the privacy of individuals. There is no experimental work involved. I can just use computer resources to profile the YSTRs and to go and search the internet databases. So basically, the entry level is not as if you need to have a lab or you need to have access to, to PCR or something like that. You just need access, you need a, a good computer and access to the internet. The information that, that we use to identify people propagates via deep genealogical ties. So it means that if you decide to participate in a study and your second cousin, once removed, donated his DNA to recreational genealogy, if you're a male, there is a chance that, we, that someone can identify you because of, of, of the, the, the way that the information propagates. And I also show you that this, the attack completely relies on public resources. You, you don't need any special access to any database. All the data is available online. And I, I gave you links to these databases. And I showed you evidence based on testing close to 1,000 YSTR haplotypes to recover the, the, the rate, the probability uh, uh, of a surname in the United States. I showed you how we can identify Craig Venter and that we can identify close to 15 indiv uh, individuals that are part of the Korean database using this technique. So our study was published in Science in January. And before the publication, we this is you know this it's it's controversial study right like you want to make sure that you, you you expose this vulnerability but to do that in responsible way so before the publication we went and we talked with all the stakeholders that we can think that are involved in in, in the thousand genomes uh, 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 um, in, in this cohort in the thousand genomes so we talked with the thousand genomes steering committee with the nhgri and with the University of Utah that originally collected these samples. And we, we got very, you know, this uh, um, received very uh, uh, nice uh, attention from, from, the, from the community. In fact, uh, Nature Editorial thought that this was a very uh, um, a good way to address uh, vulnerabilities uh, in privacy research. Also, we based our, uh, we, we, we discussed our results with the NHGRI and we hold on our publication until they were ready to, to respond to, to, to this uh, vulnerability. So what they did, they removed the ages 
from the Creel database. It doesn't completely prevent identification, but it raises the, the bar. It, it becomes harder to re-identify these people. And also, I highly encourage you to read their, their perspective about our study. Basically, we hold on the publication of our study until they wrote their perspective so they can, you know, they, they, we, we publish it back to back with them to give the readers really a, a integrative and comprehensive overview of, of, a, a, of, of this vulnerability. So let's go back to, to the, our starting point. So, you know, we said, you know, the starting point was that all mixed data are theoretically identifiable, but you need this considerable effort and that the risk is highly remote. And what we showed you that at least technically, uh, this risk is not highly remote and it, it's feasible to identify subsets of genomes that are out there uh, using just public resources. Okay, so I have another part of, of my talk and this part is more of a conversation, how we should move forward. But before I go to this part, let me let me go to the Q&A and let's see maybe there are some questions that I can address and then we can we can move to the second part, which is it's basically more kind of like a slides to facilitate the conversation and how to uh, uh, how to move forward. But before maybe I do that, let me just I want to acknowledge the people that were involved in this study. So most of the study was done by Melissa Jimrick. She's a second year Harvard MIT student in my lab, very talented uh, student. We also collaborated as part of this study with Amy McGuire in Baylor and uh, David Golan and Aran Halperin uh, from Tel Aviv University. So now I will go here and let's see the Q&A. Let's see if I can. Um, okay. So we have, I, I hope that I pronounced the name correctly, Moon Ching Li. Uh, he or she asks, what is the economical motivation behind these companies which commercialize such databases? And how is the process of prevention of breaching of privacy being regulated? Very, very, uh, two very good questions that, that uh, we, uh, that I'm asked here. So the economical motivation in these databases is that people are interested in their genealogy and they are interested in finding their relatives. And this is the reason why these companies offer the, these tests. Now, they, they don't restrict the access, some companies don't restrict access to their databases because they want to, to have other people from other companies to go to their database and also donate the, the data. This way they can really accumulate more data and connect with more and more people. So they also allow other people to search, even if you didn't pay to, to participate in the test, you can just go with the markers that you have from a different company and then search uh, for the results. And this way they can get more, more traffic and more matches in their databases uh, using, um, by, 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 by basically putting these databases available. Now, the other question was, how is the process uh, basically if we can regulate these databases, right? So there are two answers uh, for, for, for this question. The first answer that it's extremely hard to regulate anything on the internet, right? People, they own their own genome. They can publish their own genome, right? We, we cannot tell people don't publish your own genome. And once these databases are set, it, it, it's extremely hard to, to say that you are not allowed to publish something about yourself online. Right. The second uh, uh, answer for this question is that even if right now there will be some regulation and somehow these databases will be shut down, there, the, the information is already scattered online. So there are other databases that replicate, that mirror the, the, the main database and they are in other places outside of the US. Some one database is actually in Russia, quite big database. I think it would be extremely hard to, to develop a legal framework that will allow the, the regulation or, or to res restrict access to these databases. And what we have right now is this complex ecosystem, right? That um, we have recreation genealogy on one side. We, we don't want to harm this industry. This is a wonderful industry. As I said, I participated in some of the tests. And also we have the scientific, right? The, the, the scientific endeavor that we collect and we want to share whole, uh, uh, we want to share as many genomes as possible. 
we just need to uh, um, to think how this in this ecology how the two uh, 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 this in this ecosystem how these two uh, activities can live together. Okay, we have another question from uh, Fiona Nielsen, and she asks. The study you showed was based on repeat regions. Do you have some comments on the risk of identification from SNPs alone? Very good question. So, on the Y, so, so let's let's separate. We have the SNPs on the Y chromosome and the SNP on the autosome. So, right now, you need a lot of SNPs on the Y chromosome to really get to the right surname because SNPs on the Y chromosome mutate much slower than these STRs. And there, there are some community efforts that started to collect surnames and Y SNPs. And I, in the manuscript, if you go to the discussion part of the manuscript, you, we cite one of these resources, so you can check it. It has only a few thousand uh, uh, Y SNPs and surnames, so it's not really developed. But other companies, we, we know that uh, uh, family tree DNA and other companies are currently enter uh, to the world of high throughput sequencing. So maybe we're going to see more studies of SNPs and surnames. So maybe this will be this risk will be uh, 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 will emerge in the future. Now the other part, what about the risk of identifying people from their autosomal SNPs? So the, the easiest technique to identify someone from, from autosomal SNPs is just to compare his DNA, right? Like basically to take 30 SNPs on the autosome and see if these 30 SNPs match the, the, the individual in the database. There are other techniques that involve familiar searching using SNPs on the autosome. There are some papers, more theoretical papers about it, but I'm not I don't know any study that used publicly available resources that you can take autosomal SNPs and use them to search a, a relatives of people. Although I think that there are at least few resources that um, allow you to do that, but there are no studies that really check that empirically. So I, I don't know what, what is the risk. I cannot quantify this, this risk uh, for autosomal SNPs. Okay, please go and submit more questions. If you ever will just uh, um, basically go through the next slides, how we can move forward. Okay, so there are a few techniques, right, that we can consider. In fact, some of these techniques are already this kind of like uh, pointed out in, in, the, in the two questions that I addressed. So let me go over these um, six techniques that we can maybe mitigate the risk using these techniques. And I, what I'm going to show you in fact, I'm not going to talk about secure computing. I'm just going to talk about the, five, the first five techniques. Um, and so one option is basically we can just mask the YSTR markers, right? We can just basically, every time that there is a YSTR marker in the genome, we can just discard the reads and not publish them. So this is the advantage of this technique that it's, it's easy, it's fast. There is almost no burden on data usage because not many people are interested in studying YSTRs. But the disadvantages is basically that this is a, not a long-term solution. As Fiona just, she, in her question, just what about the SNPs on the Y chromosome? So there is a possibility that these SNPs can still be used either to, to search genetic databases or that we can infer the Y STRs, we can impute the YSTRs using the SNPs. And we, we discussed this process in the paper. So basically you can circumvent the masking just by looking at the SNPs and, and placing back the YSTRs. So YSTR masking is not a good technique. Another uh, option is if we just um, basically, what if we take the entire Y chromosome and just toss this Y chromosome away, right? This for sure will eliminate the possibility for certain inference. The disadvantages is first there is some community pushback. So the director of the Whitehead Institute where I work is David Page and he's highly interested in the, in the Y chromosome. And uh, uh, I don't think that people that are interested in the Y chromosome are going to like this, this option. 
but you know, there are other disadvantages, but the main one is, is this sustainable? Because, okay, we just, in this study, we showed the limitation of, or, or the vulnerability of inferring surnames from the Y chromosome. Maybe tomorrow there will be another study using autosomal SNPs that will allow you to infer uh, uh, different types of relationships and use that to triangulate individual. If we start this process of masking areas in the genome, I don't think it's going to be sustainable. I don't think we should address challenges by masking areas and, and chopping the genomes into pieces. Okay. Another option that was part of the of the Q&A was maybe we should just, you know, shut down these genealogical databases. And, the, you know, this will eliminate the, the this problem of surname inference. There will be no burden on the genomics community, right? If we shut down these databases, we as a human geneticist, we need to do nothing, right? We don't need to master data. There is no problem. The disadvantages, as I said, is that first, this is internet censorship. It's legally, it will be very hard to do that. And it's also nearly impossible to really remove all the entries from the internet because there are so many websites. Here we just list some of the websites that put YSTRs and surnames information. It would be almost impossible to remove all these websites uh, uh, from, from the internet and to make sure that there are no mirrors and they're not in Google cache and, and so on. Okay. Another uh, option is you know, the, the, regular, the regular suspect, right? The, the, the regular thing that we can do. Just access control. Let's take the entire genome and put it behind a lock. And we're going to give the keys to the key only to people that we trust. So this will eliminate, you know, any any privacy problem in general. It's not very technically challenging to do something like that. It's quite easy. But there are other problems that we need to, to consider. And I started this talk by by showing you two studies that we conducted just in my group that we identified the genetic basis of devastating disorders using healthy people that donated their genome. We will not, we will not be able to do that without these people that, that donated their, their genome. So, so access control is, is a valid option technically. The question if we really want to do that. Another option that I really like and I advocate, but again, it's, it's, a, it's personal taste, right? is that we will continue to do data sharing, but we will tell our participants about the risks in, in, in whole genome sequencing. We will tell them that they might be identified, but at the same time, we also tell them about the benefits of participating in whole genome uh, sequencing studies, how much it contributes to society, how much it contributes to people that are affected by devastating disorders. And by doing so, by telling them the benefits and the risks, the hope is to get enough people that uh, will participate in the studies and, uh, and, and but really to, to, that we can tune their expectations about privacy. And I think one of the um, leaders in this school of thought is Joe Church and his personal genomes project. That is exactly what they do, right? They give people more than 20 pages of informed consent. And after they read the informed consent, they need to pass a test. With, and that, they, they tell them, you know, the, the test includes all the, that they understand really the risks, the privacy risk in whole genome sequencing and so on. And only then they can participate in genetic study, in, in, in the study. Of course, the disadvantage here is that some people might decide not to participate in the study and we're going to reduce the our uh, um, the, 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 the participants that we can we can recruit to uh, uh, to uh, genomic studies, and another thing that we maybe want to consider is to add some legislation that will disallow people to to uh, uh, identify using genetic information. But the disadvantage over here, of course, is that the legislation is 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 hard. It's not something that will happen um, tomorrow. Okay, so basically I finished my, my presentation and there is another question 
and the question is by Metin, and he asks, can we apply this Y chromosome system to the mitochondria? And are there any privacy problems in mitochondria databases, uh, uh, similar to the YSTR surname studies? This is a great question. So first, people also share mitochondria, and you can go to mitosearch.org, um, so, and see that people, people sh share this information. Now, with the mitochondria, the serum doesn't properly, like, I, I'm not aware of any identifier that propagates with the mitochondria. Because most, in most Western societies, the serum propagates from, from the father's side. From the mother's side, I, I, it's hard to find any identifier, at least that I can think of, that, that goes this way. In addition, the mitochondria doesn't have the same revealing power as the Y chromosome. It, it's much smaller and you cannot get the same resolution as with the Y chromosome. So it's hard to stratify between two individuals that share a recent common ancestor versus two individuals that share a very old common ancestor. So it's less revealing. So even if, if there was some identifier, it was hard to tell, it, it was hard to, to extract this identifier accurately, the same way that we do with the Y chromosome. Okay, so I will refer you to the website, the bioconferencelive.com, CMECE, -E, if you want to obtain credit. And I would like to thank you for, for being in this conference and also to apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning. And thank you very much.